Hi guys, James at Rampant Lion Reviews again for you today with another beer review. For this one, we are going to cross the Orosund once again and we're going to go back to Copenhagen in Denmark and revisit a brewery that's featured on the channel many times before. I've had some really nice beers from these guys over the years, quite a few different styles, but I think it is fair to say that this brewery are still best known for their different kinds of IPAs and these days for the New England Hazies. But the beer we're going to have a look at today is one of their latest releases. It is supposed to be a very nice one. There was a little bit of hype around this beer from what I understand, but uh, I'm curious to see what it's going to have in store for us. So hopefully this is another good beer. Hopefully it makes for an interesting review. And as always, I hope that you guys enjoy my take on this one as well. So yeah, for this review, we are going to head to Gorloza in the northwest of Copenhagen. And we're going to have a look at another beer from Dry and Bitter Brewery. So this particular beer is called Romanoid. It comes in at 7.5% ABV and it's another New England hazy, whatever you want to call it, IPA. They're listing this one as a double IPA on the can. So I guess 7.5% is the very edge of what you can consider double or imperial or whatever but yeah normally I would consider about 8% to be a double imperial but if we're talking 7.5 yeah that's the very edge of what you can call imperial but um, yeah it should be quite nice this one but this beer was bought once again at Beer Hive in Amar in southern Copenhagen and a big thank you to Jessica for the recommendation she's always got a bunch of different dry and bitter beers but I always go into uh, into Beer Hive to get a good selection of Danish stuff when I go over to Copenhagen. And there was a lot of dry and bitter stuff in there, like I said, and when it comes down to it, to be honest, I tend to just pick the one that either I like the name of or I like the artwork on. But this one was Jessica's personal recommendation. So yeah, big shout out to her once again. I'll put the link to her Facebook page or Instagram or whatever for, um, for Beer Hive in the video description below. So do make sure you check her shop out if you find yourself in Copenhagen. But let's crack on with this beer then and see how we go. So as always with my reviews then, I'll tell you a little bit about the brewery before we taste the beer. If you want to get straight to the tasting, just fast forward. All the usual links are in the video description below. That's the brewery website, the link to my other reviews that I've done from Dry and Bitter Brewery before, and we will no doubt add more to that list in the near future. But there's all the usual social media down there. If you want to see more reviews, do please consider subscribing to the channel. The whole channel, of course, has a geography-based tagging system, so you can go into the homepage and search for beer based on country, city, state, county, province, prefect, or whatever it is you happen to be interested in. Do check out the playlist of beers from different countries. There is one there for all the Danish beers I've reviewed for you. That's being added to very regularly, of course, because I live in Skåne in the south of Sweden, very close to Denmark. And as always, please do get in touch and let me know some of the other beers and breweries that you guys would like to see me review. It's always great to hear from you guys that are watching the videos and the support that you show the channel is hugely hugely appreciated. So anyway, on to my brewery notes then. So Dry and Bitter Brewery was founded back in 2015 by the owners of Fairman Torin. This is Soren Parker Wagner and Jay Pollard and this was basically as a continuation of the Crooked Moon Brewing brand that they had had previously. So these guys were also involved in the foundation of Ul Collectivit which is a collective brewing space in Gorloza along with a few others who of course went on to form their own companies. But the brewery still brew their beers days to day um, and along with Gamma for a long time who have now moved on to their own brewery and Ulsnagern who are still brewing there as well. But Bad Seed, Black Rooster and Ghost Brewing among a few others have also brewed their beers here at different points. But in addition to the Copenhagen Fermentor, which is quite close to the central station and the meatpacking district, these guys have another bar in Aarhus as well. And both of the Fermentor bars have beers that are brewed exclusively for them. But today these guys are brewing in the region of, I think it's about 350,000 litres of beer per year and they've been gradually expanding the brewery capacity. But they also host their own festival which is called Fermentorin's Flying Circus and uh, I think they are going to start that up again this year in 2022. But as of March 2022 when I'm filming this review for you, these guys have produced around 200 different kinds of beer and they're also producing some sour beers now as well from what I've seen. So uh, yeah, I think it's fair to say that this brewery is best known for the New England hazy IPAs these days. But yeah, I've had some very nice West Coasters from them. I've had uh, Imperial Stouts. I think we've had one or two other styles from them as well, come to think of it. But uh, yeah, Dry and Bitter Brewing are a very solid all-round brewery. Definitely one of the Danish ones that you need to check out if you get the chance. But, uh, pardon me, yes, that is all I can tell you about these guys for the moment. 
Um, if you want to learn more, you can check out the brewery website. You can follow them on Facebook and Instagram to keep up to date with all the latest goings on. And you can check out the Rate Beer, Untapped and Beer Advocate pages to learn a little bit more about all the different beers that these guys have done. So, uh, yeah, let's get on and have a look at the beer itself then. So, as you can see, the artwork on this one is a little bit different from the kind of trippy painting sort of stuff that you'll normally get on the uh, the dry and bitter beers. I'm not sure exactly why that is or what the inspiration for this, uh, the inspiration for the name of this one was, but um, yeah, it is quite interesting anyway. So there you can see the dry and bitter brewing symbol and then Romanoid. It tells you a little bit about the beer underneath. So it says this one, uh, step into the future past raw, raw bed robots and onyx topped pillars ruminate on verdant hills. Here, a double dry hop of Strata Citra and Equinox gives you sweet peach, mango and marmalade in the nose while, uh, while citrus and mango flavours sit on a soft, hazy body with a smooth finish. Mm. So it does sound quite interesting. As I said, Jessica told me there was quite a little bit of hype around this beer. But the three hops in this one we do know fairly well. So Strata is an American hop. I think that's got a slightly stronger alpha acid content, you know, about 15-16%. But uh, it tends to give you a big kind of melony flavour and a little bit of strawberry actually, but it can have some tropical notes too. Citra, of course, we know very well, American, 14% alpha acid, big juicy mangoes and also quite a big citrusy component to it. And then Equinot, uh, about 14% alpha acid again, but it tends to give you quite a big limey character in, uh, in my mind. So listing all these different kind of fruits here, peach, mango and marmalade, that's quite interesting. We'll need to see how that goes. But um, yeah, this beer I believe cost me 50 Danish kroner, so that is going to be roughly about 65 Swedish kroner, um, 6 euros 50, somewhere in the region of like £5.50 sterling and I guess at about $7.50 American for the can, just so that you, those of you watching in different parts of the world have a wee bit of a price reference. But remember, Scandinavian beer is pretty expensive just because of the labour costs and the strength of the currencies and so on, but relative to the wages, it's no bad. But yeah, let's crack this guy open and see how we get on. The Romanoid 7.5% double dry hop, double IPA from Dry Mr. Brewing Company in Gorlos in Copenhagen. Let's crack on. And thank you again to Jessica for the recommendation. She's got a lovely little beer shop there and it seems to be doing pretty well. So that's always nice to see the craft beer associated businesses doing, doing well. So, if you do want to go and visit her, of course, uh, it's the Amabro uh, metro station that you want. So, if you're coming from Sweden, get off at the airport and jump on the metro. Um, or if you're uh, in Copenhagen itself, go to Kungens Nutov and take the yellow line, I want to say. Yeah, anyway, there we go. Now, we've got a good little bit in the, uh, in the glass now. I think there's still a wee bit left in the can, but it certainly looks very nice. So, as you can see, this beer is poured with a solid finger, just under a finger, of a frothy, I would say, kind of cream, slightly fawn-coloured head there. Definitely a cream-coloured head rather than a, uh, a straight-up perfect white head. But yeah, there's one or two big bubbles sticking toward the side of the glass, a few little ones going up toward the bottom of the head there. But overall, it looks pretty nice. So, um, yeah, in terms of the colour of the beer, in terms of the colour of the beer, this one looks like, um, I would say, a kind of dark mango juice, or maybe a mix of a mango and pineapple juice. So yeah, definitely a kind of darker, slightly more murky yellow colour. You can see that quite nicely. I always like comparing these New England IPAs to different fruit juices because that's just what the appearance reminds me of. But remember, the colour of your beer depends on one, the type of malts that you use. That goes a long way to determining your EBC rating. Two, the length of your wort boil is also going to play a role because the longer you boil the wort, the more the sugar is caramelised, thus you get a darker colour of beer. Any barrel agent that you do or any adjuncts that you put in will affect the colour of a beer as well, but not we don't really have to care about that when it comes to New England IPAs. Now, the level of haze on this one for a 7.5 percenter is pretty decent. It is pretty decent, actually. Now, remember, the level of haze can change from beer to beer and brewery to brewery. It depends on the oak content, wheat content and the yeast so uh, yeah, you will find the uh, kind of variances in that. But in terms of what you would expect from a New England IPA, I would say that this beer looks pretty damn nice. So uh, yeah, I don't think we have to say too much else about the appearance of this one. It certainly looks good and looks as you would expect for the um, 
for the style. So yeah, let's take a closer look at the aroma then and see how we get on. We don't need to say anything else about the appearance of this one. Oh, this is interesting. This is interesting. Now, um, this one to me, uh, compared to some others that I've had from Dry and Bitter, actually comes across as a little bit more kind of yeasty. I'm getting quite a wee bit of that kind of farmhousey, crackery sort of character out of it. So that is very, very interesting. Uh, in terms of the green component, it's got a lovely mix of bright floral notes and kind of zesty, grassy characters, and the fruity side of things is quite interesting as well. I'm getting a lot of the 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 strata notes out of this. Strata has a really interesting um, presence when you put it in these New England IPAs. I'd love to see what it's like in a West Coaster, but I've not seen, I don't think I've seen any uh, strata hopped West Coast IPAs. But yeah, the aroma of this is pretty interesting and quite different from what we've had from Dry and Bitter uh, for quite a wee while. So um, yeah, this is going to be pretty nice, I'm sure. And I think it's very fresh as well. I think, I think, um, Jessica said this had only been canned like, a, like last week or something like that. So it is in very, very good condition. But yeah, aroma-wise, this is very interesting. Let's break it down for you a little bit then and just describe it. So the backbone of this beer for me, there's a little bit of a... There is a little bit of a um, kind of Jacob's Cream Crackery type note to this one. So yeah, lovely Jacob's Cream Crackery type quality to it. On top of that, you get a little bit of bread crust, a little bit of that kind of fresh, um, how do you see, you get a little bit of that kind of um, fresh hedgehog roll, bread crusty type thing. There's a little bit of white bread sitting on top of that, you can smell that kind of fluffy white bread from the barley malt in there, but um, yeah, I think that um, that goes together very, very nicely actually. Yeah, aroma wise, this beer is pretty damn nice so um yeah um the multi side of things on top of that um this one does have i think it does have wheat and uh i know it's just got a bit of oat in it this one that's quite interesting i was going to say you can smell a little bit of wheat i still get a little bit of wheaty bitiness in the back of the nose which is interesting but yeah um you can smell on top of the the bready layer on this one you can certainly smell a kind of a, quite a smooth and slightly dry oaty character and that's interesting because normally the oats um the oats tend to be very very creamy when the beer is very young and then when it gets a little bit older um you know the, it starts to dry out a little bit and that's what usually tells you the age of your new england ips but i do find that this one it actually has it has a bit of the creaminess to it but it also has a little bit of the dryness and the oats are giving you a wee touch of sweetness i think as well and for me you're just getting little hints of that kind of Werther's original butter candy, butterscotchy type vibe out of this beer. So yeah, there's a few interesting things going on with this one actually, which I can uh, I can certainly appreciate. But uh, yeah, aroma wise, this one is pretty nice, I have to say, uh, on the malty side of things. But like I said, at the back of the nose, I certainly get a little bit of what I would have thought uh, was a bit of wheaty bitiness, so that kind of lingers there for me. You're getting a little bit of a kind of more dense, doughy, yeasty kind of thing in this beer as well, so you can feel that, yeah, that dense, doughy yeast, a little bit of a more, um, yeah, there's a little bit of a more, uh, how would we say, yeah, there's a wee bit of a more kind of grainy sort of thing to it as well, which I can appreciate, and um, yeah, it has a little bit of that sort of farmhousey, woody type vibe to it as well. So some interesting yeasty things. And it's like I say, that sort of crackery, uh, farmhousey, woody sort of thing is a little bit more prominent in this one compared to some others that we've had from Dry and Bitter in the past. So some interesting elements uh, coming out of this beer for sure. Uh, let's focus on the hoppy side of things then. Don't think there's anything else we need to say about the, <clears throat> pardon me, the malty and yeasty side of this beer. But uh, yeah. So, on the um, hoppy side of things, I'm certainly getting a wee bit, um, that's one of the other things that's coming out of the yeast of this, it's actually giving you a little bit of that kind of herbal, vegetal -y sort of thing, but there's definitely a little bit of an earthiness in there, there's a wee bit of a herbal note, some nice big floral aromaticity as well, not too spicy or anything like that, just it feels a little bit deep, but I get a lot of grassy, zesty character out of this one, so yeah, some really interesting things. It happening, happening with this beer for sure. 
Um, yeah. So yeah, the the green component on this one, I think, is um, is pretty damn nice. So yeah, interesting stuff. So fruity side of things then to round off the aroma. For me, the fruity side of this beer, the strata is playing a really interesting role for sure. So I definitely can smell the melon, that kind of big oily melon forming a bit of a backbone with the fruity side of things. And yeah, for me, I've always found strata to be very melony and kind of strawberry-like. So yeah, for me, there's a definite melon presence in there. And melon can always be, you know, it always gives you quite a big, uh, you know, quite a big strong uh, component actually to these uh, to these kind of beers. I'm trying to remember the other hop that gives you the big melon. Oh, uh, cashmere, that's it. Cashmere is the one that always gives you a big melon presence as well. Um, very popular hop among Slovenian breweries and uh, that was the reason I kind of got onto that. But yeah, the um, the aroma of this one is pretty, pretty damn cool, I have to say, on the fruity side of things. So yeah, a kind of oily melon in the background. You certainly do get a wee bit of the passion fruit and a bit of the mango from the citra. That's absolutely there. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of lime for me as well in this. I can see why they say orange. It does have a wee bit of a brighter orangey character to it as well. And it's kind of surprising when you think about the 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 types of hops that you have or the, the hops that you have in this one. Because normally I would associate orange with the likes of Sabro, Amarillo, Mosaic, these kind of things. But it, I can see why they say orange out of it. Uh, I don't see why they say peach. I can see why they say mango. But for me, melon, a little bit of passion fruit. That takes a back seat to the other things actually. Mango as well, a bit of an oily lime, and then a wee bit, yeah, a wee bit of an oily lime, and then, um, yeah, a wee bit of an oily lime, and some kind of orangey character just sitting on top of that. So, um, yeah, this is quite an interesting one for sure. I do like how this, um, how this goes together aroma wise. So, as I always say, take a little bit of time to enjoy the aroma of the beer before you get stuck into it, but I think. It is about time that we have a taste of this one then. So yeah, this is the Romanoid, double dry hopped, uh, New England Hazy Imperial, whatever you want to call it, double IPA, 7.5% from Dry and Bitter Brewery in Gurloza in the northwest of Copenhagen. Let's get stuck in. Slange, skull, cheers. I'm getting hungry, obviously. Don't know if you could hear that on the camera. But, um, yeah, I'm going to say straight away, that's a lovely, lovely beer. That potentially is one of the most um, impressive ones I've had from Dry and Bitter, actually. It's, first impression of it is it's just got that really light drinkability to it, quite creamy, and it's got a real juiciness to it. That's very, that's, this is pretty damn good, actually. Um, so yeah, big thumbs up to Dry and Bitter for this, and again, thank you to Jessica for the uh, for the recommendation. Yeah, this I uh, this is quite nice. What I'll say about it is it's actually very very smooth as well. It's not too pungent in any one regard of its flavour. Um, it's a very, very easy drinking beer, actually. It almost drinks in some ways like a session IPA, although in fairness, quite a few of the, se the more session IPAs that you get these days are a little bit more kind of wheaty and zippy, just to give them a wee bit of bite to cover up the kind of lightness in a way. But um, yeah, this is interesting, and there's a wee bit of bitterness building in this the further that you go into the aftertaste with it as well. So yeah, this is, this is quite an interesting beer, a wee bit different from what we've had uh, from Dry and Bitter in more recent times. So uh, yeah, certainly got me thinking, but let's try and break it down a wee bit and give you a, uh, give you a more in-depth description of the flavour, but this is a very, very nice beer for sure. Yeah, the best beer I had, I would still say the best beer that I've had from Dry and Bitter was the Hay uh, Femme, which was their fifth anniversary triple IP. That's just a beer that will always stick in the memory for me. But yeah, the double dippy do and the triple tippy two, those were also very nice. And uh, 
I think these was it these guys. I forget if it was these guys or Gamma that did hop sweat, and I think uh, Hobo Chick back in the day was a beautiful West Coast IPA. But this is, I think this is probably one of the, the modern beers that's impressed me a little bit more. They always do good stuff, but this one does just stick out a little bit more because it's it just strikes me as being a bit different. But let's break this down then. Mm. So, backbone of the beer. Uh, yeah, the backbone of the beer. It has a little bit of a more kind of bread crusty type vibe to it. This one definitely has a wee bit of that. Um, the bread crust is forming the backbone, but then if we talk about the middle third of the palate, so definitely bread crust on the backbone, there's a wee bit of a more kind of Jacob's cream crackery sort of thing sitting on top of that, uh, which is good. And yeah, that Jacob's cream crackery thing is nice. There's one or two little woody elements toward the front of that middle third of your palate too. But then sitting on top of that, you have a wee bit more of a kind of white bready um, type vibe to it as well, which is I find quite interesting. So yeah, I think the yeah I think the um, the white bready note in this is actually very light and very crisp. To be honest with you, it's just like a very light, a, a very thin layer of a kind of slightly white. Or slightly light and fluffy white bread actually. Uh, the oats don't feel overly thick in this beer either. This one's actually a beer that's quite light in terms of its malty uh, backbone, but the yeast develops a little bit of a kind of presence. We'll come to that in a minute. But yeah, sitting on top of the light bready layer, on top of that you can feel a wee bit of a smooth, you do feel like in a nice smooth um kind of round bread, you do feel a little bit of a nice kind of smooth oaty creamy layer sitting on top of that which I like and then uh, on top of that you get a little bit of a there's a little circle in the middle of your palate where you get a wee bit of a kind of Werther's Original butter candy uh, type vibe out of the beer yeah so yeah in the middle of the palate you get a little bit of a circle Werther's Original, um, yeah, Werther's Original note, maybe a wee teeny hint of biscuit in there as well. As you go further out toward the extremities of that middle third part, it does develop a wee bit of a biscuity thing. But yeah, the further you go into this beer, the oaty smoothness and slight creaminess comes out, a wee bit of that Werther's Original biscuity, butter candy sort of thing. But um, yeah, the way that it, it comes out is is very, very nice actually. Uh, yeah, this the middle third of the palate, it gets a big thumbs up. I mean, with this one and the multi backbone, and uh, the way that it shows some of its yeasty characters too is quite nice. So, on that note, let's look at the back third of the palate border region, border region between middle third and back third of the palate. You've got a little bit of a kind of bready build up there, a wee bit of a grainy bread crust. The base of the back third of the palate um, is again kind of grainy and bread crusty, and that greenness is a little bit more kind of prominent and pungent in a sense. So, bear that in mind. The bready layer, the white bready layer is a little bit thicker, so you've got that as well. You, it does feel, you do feel as if there's a wee touch of wheaty bitiness in this one, but we know there's not wheat in the malt base of this beer, which is interesting. But um, yeah, sitting on top of that, uh, you do get the more kind of yeasty component of the beer, so you can feel there's a bit of a kind of more dense doughy, yeah, there's a little bit of a more kind of dense doughy, yeasty character to this one. But um yeah, the way that, that that goes together is pretty nice. So, uh, on top of that, yeah, on top of that you have um, the, you know, you do get just this little bit of a kind of woody, grainy, just farmhousey sort of thing. So the yeasty character in this one, as I say, I feel this beer is a little bit lighter in its malts and more relying on the yeast to give it kind of that that the backbone, the kind of the kind of smooth, sweet backbone, if you like. So that's really interesting. There's a bigger contrast in this beer between the back third of the palate and the middle third of the palate compared to some of the ones we've had. So yeah, the yeasty note, as I say, a little bit of a more dense, bready sort of thing, a wee bit of a woody, cr crackery sort of thing coming out of it too. And for me, that works really quite nicely so yeah a thumbs up 
to uh, to dry and bitter on this. But what we can see is that on the back third of the palate, the flavour of the beer feels taller, absolutely. And then as you come further forward, uh, the flavour just condenses down a little bit and squashes together. And for me, that's also uh, quite interesting. So, yeah. Um, I think that's everything we need to say about the malty yeasty side of things. Let's focus on the hoppy side of the beer. So yeah, back corners of the palate, you've got a nice little bit of earthiness there. As you move further forward, it develops a little bit of a herbal character. And as you push further forward toward the kind of front corners of the palate there, you've got a nice slightly deeper floral aromatic uh, vibe to this beer. And again, for me, that works very well too. So yeah, nice little bit of floral aromaticity on this one as you reach the kind of front corners of the palate and then round the front curve of the tongue it is a little bit lighter and more uh, kind of grassy so you've got a nice little bit of a kind of grassy zesty uh, grassy zesty vibe to this beer too the hoppy component for me the floral character does develop a wee bit of um, depth to it and maybe a little bit of bitterness the further you go into the flavour but yeah the grassiness kind of lingers there too it doesn't lean more toward uh, one over the other, but it's, it's just quite well balanced. So yeah, let's focus on the um, Let's focus on the uh, The the front third of the palate then the fruity side of things so border region between front third and middle third of your palate You've got a little bit of a more Kind of you've got a little bit of a more kind of bready bread crusty build up there than the base of the front third of the palate It's a little bit of a more kind of smooth bready sort of thing so yeah the way that that goes together is uh, is pretty nice actually um yeah on top of that you get that nice kind of oily bubble where the juicy fruity esters uh, roll the way out of the beer and it's quite similar to what i thought it was going to be from the uh from the from the aroma to be honest with you so let's just focus on that now so yeah um it's a very it's interesting because this beer there's quite a contrast between when you take the liquid in and it's very bright and very juicy and then when you go into the aftertaste it sort of changes a little bit so on the back half of that front third of your palate i get a wee there's a teeny little bit of passion fruit there but the base of the flavor that lingers into the aftertaste on the back half of that front third of your palate it is the more kind of pungent mango uh, sorry the more pungent melon and then on top of that you get the juicier mango so yeah that's the strata that's giving you the the melon and the the, the citra that's giving you the the mango so yeah strata is very much forming the base of the beer and that lingers there then you've got the juicy mango on top and then when you move into the kind of front half of that front third of your palate you get a um you get the more oily um lime you get that nice big oily lime from equinox and um yeah that that lingers there too you get that yeah that big melon you know that big oily lime character from the equinox and it works it really does work so uh yeah the way that that goes together is pretty nice on top of that um you do get a wee bit of orange in the beginning a wee bit of that kind of orangey marmalade sort of thing that they're talking about but yeah um Yeah, there's a wee bit of the orange in the beginning, but for me it quickly gives way to a kind of quite juicy uh, and bright lime. But yeah, the fruity side of this beer is quite interesting. For me, it's the lime and the melon that kind of dominate there, but the, the other flavours, the wee bit of passion fruit, the big juicy mango and the slightly orangey character, those kind of disappear in favour of those um, slightly more oily flavours that you're getting. But yeah, I really like how this one uh, goes about its business. It gets a big thumbs up from me. Um, flavour profile on this is very very nice so yeah I think that's everything we need to say about the flavour in terms of the, the mouth feel I would say that this beer is uh, yeah I would I would say that this beer is yeah mid body that's right in the middle of the spectrum the carbonation is very smooth it's got a mix of a kind of creamy sort of vibe to it and it's got a slightly wet light sort of thing to it so the, the as i say the wheat often acts as a thickening agent in these new england ipas for me so this one has that because it doesn't have the wheat it has that quite light wet but still creamy note the creamy notes of course come from the oats so you've got an interesting mouthfeel to this one so mid-bodied light slightly creamy 
but still a little bit wet. And then in terms of the hoppy bitterness, I think this one does have a wee bit more. I wouldn't be surprised if this beer is a little bit more bitter at 40 IBU. I think it gets more bitter the further you go into the aftertaste. So maybe a little bit more, um, maybe a little touch more early addition hop into this one. Because, um, yeah, well, New England IPAs don't tend to have that much early addition hop and they rely on late addition and dry hopping quite often. But uh, it's nice. It certainly is nice. Um, in terms of the malt base in this one, it has got a wee bit of dryness and things like that. And there's a wee bit more yeasty character giving you some dryness, but quite smooth, slightly creamy, slightly sweet. Um, it's well balanced. The fruity side of the beer, um, the fruity side of the beer um, has that more kind of oily, citrusy sort of thing and then you've got a wee bit of a kind of juicy tropical note on top of it and um, yeah this is a really nice beer i can see exactly why jessica recommended this one to me because it is quite different from what um from what dry and bitter have done before actually so yeah hopefully this is one that they keep around for a little while i think this might be the second time they've brewed it because i saw this one uh, i'm sure about a little bit before i bought it so i think this is one that they should think about um uh, you know, doing again if they get the chance. So yeah, I think we can leave it at that for this. This one is the Romanoid, a double dry hop, double IPA, seven point five percent ABV from Dry and Bitter Brewing Company in Gorloza in Copenhagen. And uh, yeah, let's leave it there once again. Thank you for watching my beer reviews. Until the next time, please like, subscribe, share all the usual YouTube stuff. Let me know your own thoughts on this beer in the comment section below. Let me know what your favorite beers are from Dry and Bitter. And we will know their return to these guys. But this is one that you definitely need to try if you get the chance. I think this is pretty damn solid. So one of the best lower uh, ABV New Englands that I've had from Dry and Bitter. I think that's a safe thing to say. So check out my social media. Check out their social media. But most importantly, have a go at the Romanoid uh, from these guys if you get the chance. Till the next time, Slanger, Skull and cheers.